Welcome, everyone, to this Freedom Hub's presentation of the Free Market Cash Patient. I'm your host, Jeff Cantor, along with our special guest host, Dr. Robert Campbell. We are sponsored by the Freedom Hub, which is, in fact, the Disruptors Intersection, and we're certainly not going to let you down tonight as well. And we're definitely at the your-mp.com. And just to give you a little rundown on that, we've, we've got some issues in the healthcare world, and it's topic number one tonight for sure. And it's, it's such a simplistic thing. It's hard to imagine that it's become so complicated under the circumstances, of just me seeing my doctor, right? But actually it's turned into a quagmire and everybody's involved except for the doctor and the patient anymore. And we get all kinds of information, can't make heads or tails of any of that. And now things are getting a little scary. But there are some ways to get out. We're going to talk about it a little tonight. We've got a health program that's out there right now that's definitely a way for you to kind of personally try to escape a little bit from what's going on. So you'll certainly want to investigate that at patientempowerment.mpb.health. And as I said, everything revolves around the website, your-mp.com. Let's take a quick gander over there. When you come over here, there's an awful lot of stuff to learn about and scan through under the home tab is the webinars, which is what we're participating in now, but very importantly, they're continuing the conversation. So after the webinar is over, you'll want to proceed over there in the next so many days and the current guests will be visible and you'll be able to work with guests of the past of which there's a wealth of them that were really fantastic. Uh, for tonight, we're into the webinars, as I said. So as we come over there a little bit, there's a breakdown on the webinar itself. Moving forward, there's a little rundown on what's coming up in the future and, and why I'm kind of taking this diversion is to show you that this is where the webinars get posted. So let me actually go to one that's tied to tonight's series. You'll see there's an awful lot of them. They go back for many, many years and there's some really awesome stuff. Pretty much all of them are really quite strong and a lot of these people you're gonna to wanna to engage with. So that's why that continuing the conversation is so important. Now, one of the special treats, as I indicated, is we've kind of got a new little way we're running these shows these days, and we're now going to start to have some guest hosts. So first, before we introduce the guest of the night, let's talk about our host for the night that's along here with me. This is Dr. Robert Campbell. He's an anesthesiologist. He's been pain management. He's involved with all kinds of organizations, physicians against drug shortages, um, Physicians for Reform, Free to Care, Patients Rising. In other words, a whole array of stuff. So he's really been entrenched in this whole healthcare world, helped advise the prior president. So we're really excited to have him on here. So Dr. Campbell, welcome. Thank you, Jeff, for that kind introduction. Um, um, I, uh, when you reached out to me to help, you know, co-host, I, I said, well, you know, I'm addicted to Freedom Hub already. Uh, uh, I always attend as many of these lectures as I can. And, you know, tonight we have Dr. Murray Sabrin, who will be one of many. Uh, we just seem to have the best speakers uh, with uh, a message of freedom, which is becoming more scarce. Uh, so Dr. Sabrin is, a, uh, is an author of multiple books. His latest book is Universal Medical Care from Conception to End of Life. And like always on Freedom Hub, um, you know, he has envisioned a single payer system, uh, but it's a single payer system with freedom and physician and patients at the core. So this is something that is new to me and I'm sure it's new to the audience. So without any further introduction, uh, Murray, please tell us exactly what you have in mind for America. Well, uh, I'd like to just, uh step back a little bit and ask uh, and answer the question, why is a finance or retired finance professor writing a book on medical care since I certainly didn't have not treated patients uh, over my career, but uh, the subject always fascinated me. And initially this book uh, was going to be a project about the welfare state with medical care being one component with Medicare, Medicaid and um, third party payer, the insurance companies uh, butting in. 
And after the 2016 campaign where Bernie Sanders made such a headway with his uh, Medicare for All proposal, I said, this is what I think is in the works, especially with Obamacare being passed in 2010 it was. I said, it looks like we're on a way to a government single payer system, and there has to be a rebuttal to it, and that would be the individual family single payer system as an alternative to government intrusion into what should be a very private matter, the doctor-patient relationship. And it really boils down to, from a financial perspective, who should pay for medical care? Uh, right now, we, uh, the average person, if they have in, uh, insurance from their employer, they never see a bill. They pay a copay, and that's it. So they're not price sensitive to the, to the price of uh, medical care that the insurance companies pay for. Um, and the doctors are basically uh, at the mercy of the insurance companies and Medicare and Medicaid as to what their bill would be. So I envision basically, uh, if you want to call it a revolution, since Bernie calls his uh, system a revolution, a revolution, or I should say a counter revolution to what we have today, which is the hybrid system, where uh, you have the third party payers, the insurance companies, you have Medicare, Medicaid. And what I would like to see is virtually all of that disappearing, except for catastrophic insurance, which is the real purpose of insurance to uh, protect you from uh, major financial losses because of uh, an operation that may require uh, tens and tens of thousands of dollars or, or treatment that may require uh, a lot of money over several years. So the way I envision this is, is basically the way I grew up uh, getting medical care as a youngster in New York City back in the 50s and 60s, where my parents would take me to the doctor uh, and the doctor's visit, as I recall, from the mid 50s was about $5 for a doctor's visit. And then it went to $7. Uh, I don't know when it went to seven. And then it went to $10. And our pediatrician, when my wife and I got married in uh, 1968, he kept us on as adult patients. He only had kept on a few adult patients. And so he was our physician for quite a while until he said uh, he, he can't do that anymore because the malpractice insurance was, was too high for some reason. So we finally got our own um, adult uh, general practitioner in the mid 80s. And we were, uh, have been with that practice ever since. But two months ago, we moved to Florida and I can tell you, uh, being a new resident, it is, it's a challenge to get uh, a, an appointment to see a doctor for the first time. So we finally have one, uh, an appointment coming up next week to see a doctor that was recommended by a de dentist that we finally got a hold of. So uh, it, it's an interesting th thing about relocating, especially 1,200 miles away from where you live. It, it is challenging trying to get uh, become a patient of, of uh, a doctor in the area. But once you have, I think, a general practitioner uh, relationship, then it's easy to get to the specialist because the doctors, G uh, GPs also all have relationship with a uh, specialist. But what I, what I want to get back to is what I envision, and the research I did for the book uh, led me to areas I didn't know existed, namely direct primary care, DPC, where patients would contract with the doctor and pay a monthly fee, very reasonable. And I interviewed a couple of DPC doctors, in fact, one not far from my um, where we live now in, in Fort Myers. And she told me her experience with DPC and uh, how doctors really love it who, who participate in it because they don't have to have 2000 patients, which is what a typical doctor has in a family practice. And she only has, a, she's capped her, capped her patient load, I think at 800. And she only has one assistant. There, there's not a, a, a multitude of people filing insurance forms. It's, it's a cash basis only. You pay a monthly fee and you see the doctor anytime you want. Uh, I guess uh, if you had an emergency in the middle of the night, you may see the doctor or uh, call the doctor in the middle of the night. But otherwise, for routine visits, it's, it's the best way, I think, that pe people can get medical care, quality medical care, where the doctor doesn't spend 15 minutes with you, but a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour to determine exactly what's wrong with you. and. Uh, a chart a course of action to get back to optimal health. So I think the direct primary care model is something that uh, should be encouraged. I don't know what they do in medical schools regarding encouraging the, uh, med students to be uh, DPC doctors or if they even know about it. But I think this is going to be a faster growing field in medicine because I think young doctors want to treat their patients uh, 
in a way that is not assembly line medicine, which is essentially what you see today with these very short visits. Hopefully the doctor can diagnose your problem and, and send you off on your merry way with either prescription or go seeing a specialist. So that's one part of, a, the, of the cash basis in a free market universal medical care system, having that um, relationship with a general practitioner. And then the other component would be, well, what if you need uh, to see a specialist that may cost more money than a, a routine visit to a DPC doctor. Well, here's what I envision, and we have the foundation for it already, either a health savings account or a medical savings account. I think we should have one account called a health savings account or a medical savings account, and that would be funded by you putting money in for every paycheck, like an IRA or a 401k. So this would be a super medical account that you can fund over the course of your lifetime, it would, uh, it would build up tax-free because that money would be invested in a, in a fairly conservative portfolio because you don't want to see big swings in the, in the value of that account. And that money could be used with a debit card where you it would be swiped at the doctor's office so you would pay for specialty services. Now, the thing that I learned is that a lot of these specialty services could be lowered dramatically. Get, let me give you one example. I recently attended at the beginning of August the annual conference of the Free Market Medical Association based in Oklahoma, uh, co-founded by Dr. Keith Smith, uh, who operates the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, which is a cash-only basis. And I met these wonderful doctors there and other medical professionals who are, provide, who are doing great for their patients, doing great for their employees. And one uh, VP of uh, Human Resources told me that uh, in order to keep their costs down, they contracted with a company that sends over a truck so employees can get an MRI. The cost of the MRI, either to the company or to the individual was $400. Now here's the interesting thing about it that should get every American upset and show what a big ripoff the current system is. That same truck went down the road to a hospital where the hospital was offering MRIs. The hospital was charging $6,000 for the same MRI. In other words, $400 in the free market $6,000 from the hospital, which was paid for either all or part by insurance companies. And that, of course, necessitates high premiums in order for, uh, for the um, MRI to be paid for at that exorbitant rate. So when I heard that example of how the current system is totally a ripoff of employers and, um, and employees, I said, I've got to put this in my next book. By the way, I'm, I'm doing a follow-up bo a book that'll be out next year. I'll begin writing it very soon. It's on medical insurance and the uh, workplace. And given all the uh, people I met at this conference, they're gonna be part of this uh, journey that, to show business people, CEOs, CFOs, uh, small business owners, that they can provide medical care if they want to with, uh, for their employees at a fraction of what the traditional hospitals and other providers are now doing. So this is very exciting to me that people are being creative and innovative across America in order to keep costs down. So think about it, from $400 per MRI to $6,000. So the $400 represents what? About a 90% discount to what is traditionally the, the price of an MRI. Could you imagine if we did that across the board in all these uh, services? We could get the $4 trillion a year medical bill in the United States down to what? Under a trillion dollars. That would be a 75% discount. So that's one of the, I think, the exciting uh, developments in medical care today is that um, we're tr companies and individuals are trying to avoid the middleman as much as possible, and that would be the hospitals. And hospitals are starting to catch on that uh, they are overcharging or overpricing their services, and they're starting to, to figure out that in order for, to keep their, quote, customers, they better do something about, uh, about these high costs of MRIs and other uh, uh, services. So that's the other thing. Then, of course, the, the real reason you have insurance, as I pointed out earlier, is to prevent catastrophic loss. And so if people started putting money away in a catastrophic insurance policy, uh, first of all, parents could do that with, with youngsters, and that account would build up just like a uh, medical savings account, uh, or they would pay the insurance company in case 
a youngster has a need for a major operation that could cost two hundred thousand dollars that would be paid for by having the child covered with a with a catastrophic policy and if given that there are what uh over two million births in the united states we could have a nationwide uh insurance pool for, for that to just handle the youngsters then of course as uh uh people aid get uh get older we they can increase the, the premiums because as we know as you get older there's more uh uh probability of having a major illness whether it's cancer or heart disease or what uh, or name it that may require a substantial uh, cost but it, then again the cost would go down because th there would be no incentive for insurance companies to charge high premiums because there would be a huge pool of money to do this so that's the th the three ways of uh having the individual family the individual uh single person get high quality medical care through a cash payment system and the only time you'd need insurance would be for catastrophic illness now what about the two big costs to the federal government which means the taxpayers which is medicare and medicaid that's pretty complicated so i discussed that in the book that's why i want people to uh, buy the book and read it because all the royalties will be going to support free market organizations like uh, uh, the Free Market Medical Association and other economic educational organizations. In addition to, uh, I will be supporting, continue to support, hopefully in a much uh, larger uh, contributions to nonprofit health centers. Uh, three of them in New Jersey I've been supporting. One I helped create in Bergen County in the early 2000s, and they're up and running. I have a chapter devoted to the nonprofit center. So the nonprofit centers, theoretically, I think practically, can su 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 uh, replace Medicaid that $600 billion cost to the federal government and state governments, which means the taxpayers. So I have in the book uh, a chapter on how that could be done, where we could create all these nonprofit health centers across the country. And if Bill Gates and Mike Bloomberg and the other multi-billion, Jeff Bezos and the other multi-billionaires in the United States, Warren Buffett, if they really want to leave a great legacy for the American people, they would go to volunteers in medicine, sort of the umbrella organization for the volunteers in medicine model. They don't take any taxpayer dollars. It's all funded through voluntary contributions and work with them to create nonprofit health centers in, in the communities, such as uh, Bedford Stuyvesant in, in New York, Harlem, uh, uh, downtown Newark and uh, Patterson in, in New Jersey. Uh, in in uh, Florida, I guess there, Fort Myers could use one as well. Jacksonville, just go around the country and see where the biggest needs are, where you have the highest concentration of Medicaid patients, and and create these nonprofit health centers. And who would run them? You could have retired doctors, and you could have current doctors that could give four, six, eight hours a week to such a venture. And this would be the example of the mutual aid societies pre the Great Depression blooming in the 21st century to replace medicaid now that's the other component of a free market universal uh, medical care system and the and the th uh, the last component would be how to transform medicare into a free market system so that's a lot of detail which i have in the book but essentially uh, again people in their working years would set aside money that would be used when they retire to pay for their medical expenses. So we could start that right away and have the government uh, allow people to create these super uh, medical savings accounts that would be tax deductible and they would earn interest free and they would be taken out tax free. So again, that's the theme of my book from 1995 to create a tax free America. So this would be part of that whole program is to get government literally out of the medical field lock stock and barrel and have individuals families doctors communities devise their own medical care infrastructure all right that's a big word today infrastructure but do it on a free market basis on a voluntary basis and prices would come down quality would go up because doctors would not feel pressure to see fifth, uh, patients for 15 minutes and uh, the emergency rooms would be empty because people would have a place to go to at the local uh, nonprofit health center or the DPC uh, G, uh, general practitioner. And we would have a much stronger uh, medical care system that would be patient centric as opposed to trying to meet all the rules and regulations of Medicare, Medicaid and the insurance company. So I am totally anti-bureaucratic when it comes to 
not only medicine, but education, housing, um, transportation, you name it. Bureaucracy is a dead weight on the economy. And the more we can reduce bureaucracy, the more resources are freed up for actual delivery of services, no matter what that is, education, medical care, what have you. And another component of what I'm talking about in the book, I have a chapter devoted to uh, wellness. I interviewed a, a longtime friend who's a naturopath and his journey from uh, someone who had uh, medical issues to being a great naturopath in New Jersey, helping people uh, solve their problems without uh, major pharmaceutical uh, uh, drugs and helping people with uh, heart issues and uh, cancer issues. He works with doctors, traditional doctors. In fact, he told me that traditional doctors have um, viewed, been in his office and see shadow him, I guess that's the term, shadow him to see exactly what he does to help his patients reach optimal health. And I referred um, a young woman, not a, young, not a very young woman, who had a breast cancer issue, and she saw uh, Dr. Jero, and uh, she loved what he, uh, he did for her. So these are typical examples of what you find out when you have the free market working in medical care. And unfortunately, the mindset in the United States today is we have to have a collectivist approach to everything. And this is the sad reality of where America is in 2021, is that collectivism is really entrenched, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and other issues, that the people think that there's no alternative but expanding Medicare and Medicaid. And that's exactly what these spending bills that the Biden administration is getting through Congress is expanding Medicare, when we should be going the opposite way, where we should uh, uh, lower taxes, give people the opportunity to save and invest their money so they can have the resources in order to pay for their bills. So one of the themes of my book is personal responsibility, personal social responsibility, where you are not a burden on your neighbor, because if the government is paying for you, that means the government has to tax somebody else to pay for you. So that's a burden that they didn't, no one asked to be uh, the, the, uh, the, pay, the payer uh, master, if you will, for people who, uh, who don't have the means to do so. So all the ingredients of a free market medical system a free market universal medical system is already in place. All we have to do is begin the transition. And that's why I wrote the book to educate as many people as possible, hopefully tens of millions of Americans saying, hey, you know, we're getting ripped off by this system and there's a better way of making sure that everyone is covered. And that's what the book talks about is how everyone can be, be, uh, can be covered from the time of a woman knowing she's pregnant to, to the end of life where you have total control of your medical care decisions, as opposed to today where we have this sort of top-down approach, this trickle-down economics, this trickle-down medical care, where people have to genuflect between what Fauci says and what the CDC says and these other mega um, government agencies. So I'm firmly in the camp that um, uh, government that governs least governs best, and we should separate the medical care from, um, from the government. And besides, the Constitution is on our side, because nowhere in the Constitution does it authorize the federal government to be involved in medical care. I took an oath in 1959 when I became a U.S. citizen to uphold the Constitution. In this book, I do so by saying there's no such thing as a health care right, it's because that means that someone has a duty to provide health care, which, of course, is a misnomer. That's the other thing I discuss in the book. We seem to conflate health care and medical care. No, medical care is what we seek when we're not, we don't have optimal health care. And the person responsible in the health care sees you every morning when you look into the mirror. You are responsible for your health care, not, not Biden and previously Trump or Obama, not Fauci, uh, not uh, Walensky, the uh, head of the CDC, not your governor, not your mayor. You are responsible for your health care. And the scary thing is, the American people are getting sicker and sicker by the day. And I did a whole uh, lot of research in this area that if we don't change course, and that means people taking control of their lives and trying to reduce their weight, exercise more, eat the right foods, uh, the numbers are pretty frightening for 2030. And that's not that far away that more than 50% of American uh, adults will be obese. And uh, who knows how many of them will be morbidly obese, which would be, I think, defined as what, 100 pounds or more overweight, 
which we know is, uh, is the cause of a lot of chronic illnesses in this country. And diabetes seems to be on the rise, which uh, leads to a whole host of issues. So I could uh, have Dr. Campbell uh, comment on that also. But I am optimistic, given uh, uh, attending this uh, annual conference of FMMA, and of course, you can go to their website, fmma.org, because people are not waiting for the government to tell them what to do to improve their employees' um, uh, medical situation or to reduce costs. They're doing it on their own initiative, which suggests to me is that if the government got out of the way, the unleashing of entrepreneurship, the unleashing of creativity, innovation in medical care would increase exponentially. And that means that we would have a much healthier society. Costs, the $4 trillion medical care costs would go down by uh, multifold, and we would have a much healthier economy, much healthier people, and we could do greater things in the country. So uh, with that in mind, I'd love to take questions from the people that are on, on, on uh, the call tonight, because uh, this is an exciting time in American history, even though we have this uh, pandemic, which is causing people on incredible anxiety, really incredible anxiety. We know what the, what the data are regarding alcoholism and uh, drug abuse and uh, increased suicides. And this is a sad commentary of what the government has done by not um, uh, allowing doctors to treat their patients uh, in a humane way and allowing them to use protocols which are, which are not uh, uh, sanctioned by the government. And I just was on a call today with a physician who's treating um, COVID patients and non-COVID patients with a, a, a non-protocol use. And she said she's getting incredible results from that. So if the proof is in the pudding, um, doctors around the country and around the world are using what's available rather than uh, an experimental um, shot to, to uh, try to um, ameliorate the uh, uh, COVID. But uh, having said that, uh, I, th I think there's a great opportunity for us who believe in free markets to make that case directly to the American people. And that's why I wish everyone who hears about this book buys the book and um, we get the word out that there is a much better way than the end goal of Bernie Sanders and others of a single payer government system, but the single payer individual family system would give us the best outcomes. And if Bernie Sanders and others want the best outcomes, then the, uh, this book Universal medical care from conception to end of life certainly will achieve that objective. Fantastic, Professor. That was really quite good. And, you know, you're symptomatic of what myself and others on the call and many that aren't even on the call tonight have been witnessing as the under the swell of all of the market, trying so hard to get ahead of what this government's trying to do. And, and your description of the bureaucrats is, is so perfectly uh, positioned in any facet of reality. In fact, for a lot of lay people that can't get it, I always usually analogize and tell everybody, no, it's like driving your car with the emergency brake on all day. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what they're doing to anything and anything they touch. And the other nice thing you're exposing and, and everyone's starting to realize, because we all know they mark up jewelry a lot and they mark up furniture. They got nothing on what the healthcare industry is marking stuff up. No one can understand how can a $6,000 MRI be $400? When I heard that, I my head nearly exploded because why would anyone want to pay $6,000 for an MRI when you can get it for $400 in a free market? This shows you the, the uh, to use a term, the efficacy of the free market. It brings prices down to where the average person can afford an MRI. If it means that it, it's going to uncover a life-threatening illness, wouldn't you want to be able to uh, know that and, and get treated right away? And for $400, which is should be in the reach of the average working folk, especially if they've been saving all these years to pay for something like that, uh, instead of paying these exorbitant $20,000 a year for a family of four for an insurance policy, and they hardly get any benefits from that. If you're a healthy 30-something, 40-something couple with two children who are healthy, you're wasting $20,000 a year, or your employer is if, if, if it's based upon an employer uh, policy. So to me, that is a total waste of, of, of resources to pay for these insurance policies, which don't provide any benefit. But if that money went into a, an account that you could draw from, and, and it would grow over time, and, and it would be cut in half, so the employee would save 10000 and you would have 10000 in that account that would grow, uh, it's a win-win for everybody. The big losers would, of course, be uh, the insurance companies, the hospitals, and uh, big pharma. Of course, Pharma, uh, pharma prices would go down. And the, uh, as I told my doctors over the last 10, 15 years, 
my goal in life in retirement is to not be on medication and stay out of a hospital. So far, as they say, knock on wood. I'm only taking one medication, and that's basically something you can uh, buy uh, you, as a non-prescription as well. So uh, I feel very fortunate that uh, my wife and I have been um, been able to uh, achieve relatively optimal health uh, given uh, where we are in our life cycle. Excellent. Before we open up for the rest of the questions, Dr. Campbell, I'm going to let you chime in. No, thank, thank you very much. Uh, you, you know, you have uh, uh, said some things that make total sense. Of course, there is that little thing called the medical industrial complex, mm -hmm. which uh, wishes to maintain the status quo. So it's going to take people like you, your book, and like-minded thinkers to uh, be innovators and to work around the system. And that's, I think, what Freedom Hub has uh, been encouraging here. Um, uh, and, I, and Jeff, I, I can say there, there are so many hands up in the audience, I think we should. Uh, We're going to open it up as right. Start, well, let's, yeah, let's, I have Steve four hands at least. I, oh, totally. And, I, and there's some great people whose hands are up that I notice at that. So get ready, Dr. Sabrin. Here we go. Sam, I see your hand is up. Yes, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sabrin, thank you for sharing um, your thoughts. And, and I've ordered your book. I'm looking forward to reading it and completely agree with everything you're saying. Um, I had a similar M MRI experience I'll, I'll mention in a minute, but uh, my question is really relating to um, one other aspect, and I don't know if you talk about this in your book, but one other aspect of um, implementing the kind of solution you're talking about, which is change in consumer behavior. Mm -hmm. now, I'll give you an example. So I was supposed to get an MRI this uh, past March, and my doctor called in an order at the hospital. I called the hospital asked them how much it was going to cost me. I'm on a high deductible plan. They said $5,500. <laughs> and, and, and I said, what, what if I got pay you cash? Uh, would you give me a discount? And they said, yeah, you got a 50% discount, but that's going to cost you $6,500 because our charge master is $13,000. So you're better off going with your insurance. And I said, there's no way I'm paying $5,000 for an MRI. And so I called around and got the MRI for, guess what? $300. Oh, my goodness at an independent place. So a little bit better than the truck that you talked about, but you know, pretty close. And so, uh, it, but it took a little bit of effort on my part. I had to call a number of places. I had to get their prices. Some of them couldn't get back to me. I had to go back and forth. It took about a week before I got, you know, got a uh, number of prices from independent folks and got my MRI for 300, very happy. Told my friends about it. And the first question was, how do you know that MRI was any good? Was it, you know, how do you know that place is any good when you go to an independent place? Um, you know, you don't know what the quality is, et cetera. And MRI is pretty straightforward, but think about going to a cardiologist or, or some other specialty that is independent. Uh, I think there's a lot of ignorance on people's parts in terms of, you know, how do you gauge doctors? And there's a certain implied trust or confidence that's been built about going to these big hospitals that gouge you. Mm -hmm. So how do you, uh, do you have any thoughts in terms of how one overcomes this part of the challenge, which is getting consumers to actually accept some of these um, uh, new opportunities. And the reason, another, another facet to this is that I've heard a lot of employers talk about implementing these kind of programs, cost-saving programs. Um, and one of the things I had to really overcome, uh, almost in every case that I've heard about, is concerns from employees that, are you getting me actually quality care or are you, you know, giving me something substandard? And they had to put people in place, advocates and things like that to actually help people understand. And of course, once people experienced these um, alternate solutions, they were, they were comfortable with it, but it took a little bit of a hump to get over before patients were comfortable with something like this. So any thoughts on, on how, how you take, take on that part of the challenge? Yeah, I think one of the things in medicine that is fascinating is that people think the higher the price, the better the quality. Correct. And that's the myth. That's the myth that we're trying to expose here is that it's not about price. That's that the higher the price is better the quality. It's what is a reasonable fair market price for a service. And this is where, uh, uh, cons uh, if you will, uh, to bring in the, the Austrian economic school is subjective value. What is it? What is an MR are worth? And that is comes to an important part of the problem we have in, in medical care today total opaqueness of pricing. Let me give you an example of how the surgery center of Oklahoma, and I forgot to mention this when I spoke about the, uh, the direct primary care physician I interviewed at Fort Myers. 
she had an uninsured patient. Uh, so he was only paying whatever her monthly charge was, who needed an operation. <laughs> he was going to uh, find out what the local hospital was going to charge for this operation. I think it was a hip operation. I'm not quite, I, my memory serves me uh, correct. I think I have it in the book. And he was quoted $20,000. So Dr. Bernard said, uh, you better call the surgery center of Oklahoma. He called the surgery center of Oklahoma and the total cost of the operation, including transportation to Oklahoma from Florida and including, I think the hospital stay was $5,000. What? So when you have an operation and the transportation costs at 75% discount from the hospital, you can see how overpriced everything is at the hospital. And why these surgery centers, as long as they're entrepreneurial, they're transparent, they have their prices online. And there's another organization, I spoke to the founder of that organization, you may have heard about it, called Medibid.com, where essentially the eBay of medical care, where doctors bid for patients, uh, um, for patients. And uh, it works extremely well, given what I know about it. And uh, this could be the future of uh, medical care, is that doctors, uh, have a registry where they uh, post their prices for different things, whether it's a, a slip disc operation or a hernia operation or what have you. And uh, people will go and see uh, and what the reviews are. That's the other thing. Uh, we have consumer reports for products. We should have some sort of consumer reports for medical personnel as well. Who are the good doctors? And if you go to a community and you, like we just uh, got a dentist in, um, in Fort Myers where we moved to, and that's because we were in the gym and we were speaking to a, a gentleman in the gym and uh, he told us he's in the medical uh, field. Well, he uh, happens to uh, work for one of the major hospitals here. And we said, oh, by the way, can you uh, recommend a dentist? He said, yeah, I have a great dentist. And so we made an appointment and my wife saw her today for the first time and I have the appointment tomorrow. So from there, uh, we asked her, who do you recommend for a general practitioner? And she recommended, uh, her general practitioner, which is down the hallway from her uh, suite of offices. So again, it's very easy to find out, or I should say relatively easy, if you find one person, one contact person in the community who is uh, highly competent, who can then direct you to other doctors. And between the DPC and the, and the uh, transparency that doctors would post on the internet, we would drive prices down tremendously because you wouldn't have all the overhead to deal with in terms of uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, insurance. Now, Medicare and Medicaid is going to take a while to transform, but the 160 million people who get, I think, insurance through the workplace, that could be done fairly quickly, I would say over the next year or two. The challenge will be to get enough direct primary care doctors. I have, I, I've been giving a lot of thought to it since I finished the book, one way the federal government can, can encourage it, and I'm not, I'm not a big proponent of it, but I, I think it's, it's a way to, to get more med students into the direct primary care, is they could make uh, any med, grad, med student graduate who goes into direct, direct primary care or general practice to give them a tax holiday for 10, 15 years, whatever the case may be, in order to uh, get more supply of doctors into, the, into helping people diagnose their immediate problems and then taking a course of action or seeing a specialist. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to discuss what could be done to increase the number of uh, general practitioners so, so people can have access to a doctor without having to go to the emergency room and really letting people know you're in charge of your medical care, you're in charge of your health care, and you have to shop around. You know how many times people spend looking for a computer or a car? How many hours people spend for that? Why aren't they spending as much time get, finding out who the best doctor is in their community for a, an illness that they may have? So I, again, we're talking about a re-education of the American people because they've been taught that, okay, the insurance company is going to cover it. I don't have to worry about the price because the uh, insurance company is going to uh, pay whatever the doctor and the insurance company have negotiated, and I just pay a copay. So, so people think medical care is basically uh, uh, free because they pay a 10, 15, $20 copay. It's interesting. Some of the observations you're coming to is like solutions <laughs> and boy, wouldn't it be great if there was this or that? Well, get ready. You're going to find out some of that stuff exactly exists from, from some of the people about to talk to you here. So, but next in line, I see Charles has his hand up. I do. <clears throat> um, Great talk, 
Professor Sabrin about you know reforming health payments. What about the supply sides? You know, a big problem with healthcare, and one of the themes that Jeff and I have in this show is getting more integrated care yeah. uh, innovators into uh, the health payment business because people are not going to just tolerate a one size fits all old standard of care forever. Um, you know, functional medicine is exploding. People are self-diagnosing the chronic issues and they're not just accepting a pill. Um, so what about that? Licensing has, you know, uh, controls that. Maverick Dodgers get disciplined by yeah. politicized licensing boards. The education itself is substandard to a certain extent because it's all based on pharma protocols and algorithms. Um, how do you, uh, as Dr. Campbell said earlier, tackle that medical industrial complex that has its talents and the supply side to break open the supply? That's going to be really hard. CDC, well, the regulators, all of it. There's an interesting article, which I just saw the headline today in the Wall Street Journal, which gives us a lot of hope. The FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is looking at licensing at the state level because of the restriction of supply of uh, various practitioners. So uh, the late Walter Williams used to write about that, how th this was uh, hurting uh, 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 black entrepreneurs in, in, uh, throughout the country because they needed some sort of educational requirement or, or other type of requirement that they didn't have, but they were great at what they were doing, whether it was uh, in, in the barbershop or uh, the salon or whatever the case may be where you need a license. So I think we can take the next logical step and saying, what credentials do people have that may not be from a med school, but are of high quality that they can help diagnose a person's problem and uh, have a course of action. Like my, uh, like my naturopath friend up in uh, New Jersey. I mean, he has a slew of uh, continuing education. In fact, he lectures on nutrition at medical school, uh, schools. And he says, one of the biggest problems, and this I think is something we could really tackle. Is, he told me in the interview that I conducted with him is that, uh, more than half of medical school funding comes from big pharma. So you talk about a conflict of interest between what the students learn in medical school and the who's paying the bills. Remember, who, who, um, who uh, pays, uh, pays rights to rules or something to that effect. And so that's something that has to be exposed. Is, is there a major conflict of interest between what medical stu students are learning regarding medicine and health and uh, who's paying the bills. I think that's something that we need to address. And um, I'll speak to Glenn and others uh, and say, hey, let's have a webinar about uh, how medical schools are not turning out doctors who are, who are good in diagnosing illnesses. And Glenn told me in the interview that one of the, uh, his great strength is is that he's able to diagnose a person's condition through their blood test that he uh, that he prescribes, and so he recommends these blood tests that looks at various markers, and so he can uh, he can uh, recommend a course of action that can increase a person's health because he sees what the what the weaknesses are in a person's uh, 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 blood situation, and so um, if that's the case, and he said doctors tend not to be as, as good as he thinks he is in, in terms of uh, evaluating a person's health through their uh, blood samples. Uh, so again, uh, Dr. Campbell could address that, but I think there's an opportunity here, given the advances in technology, that blood tests could be made uh, readily available to, uh, to uh, nature paths and other non-traditional um, uh, medical personnel who can help people get back to optimal health, whether it's uh, through nutrition, whether it's through exercise, whether it's through uh, uh, supplements, whatever the case may be. And we know supplements don't have a high regard in the uh, medical establishment because they're relatively inexpensive and they do wonders. Um, and so when I had a problem uh, years ago, uh, uh, Dr. Jarrow recommended I get off that purple pill because of the adverse uh, consequences of that little purple pill. And so I haven't taken that old purple pill in years and years and years and addressed the acid reflux through uh, natural um, um, approaches. Very good. Paul, I see your hand up. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. I have earphones in. So uh, professor, it's lovely meeting you. Um, so my, my name is Dr. Paula Muto. I am a surgeon in active practice with an entire family of surgeons in Massachusetts, and I have a 
disruptive platform uh, called UberDoc that is in fact direct access to specialty specialists for transparent price. And specialty care is defined on our platform now, not just uh, surgical specialists, medical specialists, but specialists in internal medicine, primary care, as well as, um, you know, as well as special subspecialists. So because we're all specialists in medicine. Um, so we built this platform to remove the middleman to provide price transparency and access to care. Um, and we have now grown to uh, close to 4,000 doctors across the country in every state. We have a lot in Florida. Next time you need a doctor, you should go to UberDoc. You'll find one nearby and available. Um, so our whole, the whole point of UberDoc was to, our mission was to provide direct access and price transparency to allow doctors to connect to patients directly, remove insurance in the equation for the first step. It was very important that the story that you told, the story that I've heard over and over again is how do you get to the first step? They, they say you need a urologist. They say you need a cardiologist. Where do I find one? It's so difficult. And, and I'll tell you, it's good to have a primary care to help navigate you. But as a specialist, I'm gonna tell you as a surgeon, primary cares don't exist anymore. In my community, they're like a revolving door. The people mm -hmm. that we have relationships with are in practice and then they're not in practice or they're isolated from their patients. So they have a fleet of mid-levels that are, um, that are constantly changing. I have patients who have never seen their primary. Mm -hmm. They look at me as their primary, as their surgeon, because I follow them for their, I'm a vascular surgeon. I follow their wounds or their legs. And I also do some general surgery. I follow their breast cancer. They, I'm the constant in their equation. Um, and so things have really shifted in terms of those referral networks and so forth. So it used to be go to your primary, get a referral. Now it's go to your network and the network will dictate the referral. Yeah. This is what UberDoc was built for because there aren't enough of us. As you said, the supply chain is very limited for experienced doctors. Um, the access points are terrible. Um, again, UberDoc was designed to skip the line to get a patient in need to a doctor with availability. And I'm gonna tell you right now, we all have availability. And I'm very much in line with the uh, Oklahoma Surgery Center in the sense that when you remove a lot of the fat and you put the doctors back in charge, the price absolutely comes down. Um, the technology also that is out there is breathtaking. Uh, the cases I used to operate on, I don't operate on anymore. Pills take care of it. I do a 10 minute case in my office that I used to do two and a half, three hours in the operating room for a 10th the cost. There's no question with uh, COVID bringing on outpatient knee joint replacement that the world has literally turned on a dime. And these now prices are in fact definable and affordable. The problem is that you're up against a system that was built on smoke and mirrors, right? I always like to say, well, it's time to pull the curtain on the wizard, right? And you think about the Wizard of Oz, I always laugh because you know oh, they tell Dorothy, you gotta get the, the broomstick and you gotta go back and get something else. It's like, you gotta get a referral, you gotta get an authorization, you gotta get all these things, right? Um, and then you realize at the end of the day that it's all fake. Um, and, and so the hospitals have tried very hard to maintain their primacy in this equation. Um, they are in collusion with the insurers to keep the price high because otherwise if it wasn't a, if you didn't think you were kind of have to pay $6,000 for an MRI, then boy, Blue Cross Blue Shield, thank God, negotiated a lower price. So you have to understand there's a reason behind that, right? There's a reason for all of that smoke and mirrors. Um, so I, so from my perspective as both a doctor um, in, in practice is also a founder of this platform of an army of doctors that are not just direct pay primary cares, but direct pay doctors, including specialists coming to the table very quickly, very readily to take care of patients for a transparent price. Because the reality of practice, whether you're in an individual practice, a multi-specialty group, or you're working in a hospital, is cash flow. Mm -hmm. The reason why medicine is so derailed and these prices of $6,000 is no one's collecting $6,000. They can put that price out there, but no one's really collecting it, right? You're not getting water from a stone. It's not happening. So there's a constant deficit. So in re the reaction is to just add more, order another test, do something mm -hmm. else, keep sure. going. You know, we've gotten into this pattern now that we can't break because no one's getting paid for anything. So I do believe price transparency will is a healthy alternative to the system. I, I love health savings accounts. I think that's a great option. I think every brick and mortar doctor has to have a seat or two in their waiting room for a direct pay patient. 
It is, that is the goal and mission of UberDoc is for every doctor in this country to give me a seat in their waiting room, whether that's an individual waiting room, physical waiting room, or a virtual waiting room. This is no question telemedicine is, has enormous potential to bring specialists connected to individuals that may not be able to access that care directly and can be appropriately taken care of from a distance. So I think that there's no question, again, from the journey I've been on in the last few years, what started off is just make an appointment easily with a specialist and not get a referral has now turned into something much bigger um, in terms of giving patients the tools for that direct access and getting the doctors, the doctors to understand it's okay to take a cash pay patient. And, um, and at the end of the day, you know, that's really what it's about. And, um, and I'll have to say that in terms of ratings and competition and price setting and doctors competing, that is not in reality. Doctor's offices can barely um, answer the phone for you and make an appointment. Now you're going to tell your office manager, see who you want to bid on. That's just not realistic. And it's not in the scope of our practice. I do think transparency is important. I think that we do have multiple payers in the system. I'd love to sing, see a single payment system, <laughs> a single price. You know, a price transparency would dictate a, pair, a price. And we can't set that price, but we can set the transparency because I think it's unrealistic to think that everyone around the country is gonna have the same insurer. I think that's hard. Um, but I do believe that that, that in, in terms of reality and workflow and what's healthy um, and necessary, doctors are working really hard. Um, ratings and so forth can be purchased. If you're well-funded, you will have better ratings than if you're not well-funded. At the end of the day, we're a public trust. Patients do not choose their doctor based on a lot of ratings. If I tell you to go to this doctor and you can't get in, you'll go to doctor number two. Doctor number two becomes number one for you. You mm -hmm. do not choose your pilot, you choose your air. And for the most part, most doctors fall on a bell curve. They're well-trained, they are experienced. We joke on UberDoc that everybody on our platform is at least 35 years old because it takes that long to be a qualified doctor. There's no mid-levels on our platform. Um, and you know, you have to give the doctors a little bit of credit that they put the time and effort in. And in terms of training, I train both surgical residents and family practice residents. Um, they are burning out before they finish training. Mm -hmm. um, they're spending a lot of time charting in the electronic record, which is basically creating billable event and an invoice. Um, I have surgical residents that say they have too much charting to do on the floor because of electronic records to come to the OR. I'm like, wait, no, no, no. You've got to go to the OR and learn these cases because you're going to be out there someday. Um, the family practice residents don't take off shirts and bras or take off shoes and socks on patients. They don't have the time to, in their general physical exam to actually examine patients. Um, this is how they're being trained. Um, so it is unfortunate that there, our system has entirely derailed doesn't mean the people working in it are bad. They're dedicated, wonderful, and super smart people. And the technology, like I said, is breathtaking. And technology, I believe, will save our system because it will create better workflows because our current payment system is archaic related to the technologies we have out there. Right, let's um, wait. And I'm going to jump in one quick sec because we're fast so, running out of time. I got a okay, couple so of questions. Okay, so anyways, but anyways, but I out. just want to let you say that that that's my my, and I'd be happy to talk to you sometime. But this is my the journey I've been on, and and I think that price transparency. I think you're 100 percent correct that this is a consumer driven healthcare, and the moment we put the healthcare dollar in the charge of the patient, that a lot of good things can happen. Um, right. But uh, but anyways, but that's I just want to. Uh, kind of let you know where, where, where you are with Uber Doc and I'm happy to. I appreciate the comments. It was good. I'll, and I'd love to let us keep going, but we're, I got to keep the accuracy of the time here with the, with the doc. So go ahead, Marie, would you want to respond for a quick minute? I no, I, I just questions. wanted to give you, uh, I just didn't want to give you Paula for my next book because. Oh, there you fun. go. Okay. Well, I did put, I put the web address <laughs> in there and you see why continuing the conversation is so important to what we do here <laughs> every week, right? Enforces that. Well, I think, I think the, 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 I mean, just to be very quick, the next book, I think will will take all the great ideas I'm hearing tonight. Plus what, what I heard at the uh, annual conference in Texas last, uh, a few weeks ago, and, and, and present it to entrepreneurs, CEOs, that there's a better way of dealing with medical uh, costs than you're now doing. And uh, why don't you look at things that will make your uh, employees 
happier, healthier, and your bottom line better. I think that's a win-win for everybody. Fantastic. Well, here's some more people you're going to want to include in your research. Dr. Wallen, I see your hand is up. Uh, yes, thank you, Jeff. And thanks, Charles. And, and thanks, Murray, for your great presentation. Uh, I met you briefly at the FMMA National Conference and grabbed your book from you about yes. halfway through. And, and it's great so far. I'm, I'm waiting to finish the rest of it here, hopefully. But I guess a couple of comments and then one question. Uh, comment is... Um, one of the things, especially from an outpatient standpoint or outpatient out-of-pocket costs that can be great for patients is what's called a health matching account. That's uh, kind of a version of the health savings account, but different. Um, I'm sure Charles or myself would be happy to chat with you more about that if you're okay. interested. We are also actually having a free seminar next week and launching a, an online education program to basically teach people how to utilize a lot of these things uh, called self-directed medical and then I guess my, my main question is, you know, obviously, I, I think it's been mentioned before, too, that you can't really necessarily fight against the medical industrial complex. And, and even some of these folks that are being creative, like mitigated partners and some other folks throughout the country, they, they come back with, to me and tell me that their biggest barrier is uh, fighting against the brokers that sell insurances to these corporations because, Obviously, the brokers don't want to miss out on their commissions and such, right? So mm -hmm. how do you, I guess my question is, how do you see us best utilizing the resources we have to fight to protect and grow the free market? Th th that, I think, is the $64,000 question, because as you say, as there are more and more uh, layers between the patient and the doctor, the, the cost will increase. And so that's why I think employers are really trying to figure out how can they reduce their costs, which we know for a while, insurance costs were going up, I think, what, seven to 10% a year compounded for a decade or more. And so that really has an impact on the bottom line. And so I think um, from the people I spoke to at the uh, conference a few weeks ago, uh, they're, they're coming up with solutions, working with uh, the uh, uh, medical providers in their area and, uh, and seeing exactly how they can get the services to their employees so the uh so the, their costs are down the employees get uh, the quality of medical care because if, if an mri is four hundred dollars in the parking lot of a company why is it six thousand dollars or at least po posted six thousand dollars in the parking lot of a hospital it doesn't make any sense and so i think companies are figuring this out more and more and what paul is doing with uh her uh, platform to me is is how the internet and how uh technology is going to really break through this um, this um, status quo that we, that uh, everyone's frustrated with. And so I think people are creative. That's one of the things I learned in teaching business for 35 years, that people are incredibly ingenious and creative. And look what happened during COVID, all the great ideas that came about because of COVID, unfortunately. Uh, but the, I think those ideas were germinating anyway, and it just, it just came out sooner. But um, I think uh, one of the things that we need to do is to have more sessions like this and invite uh, traditional doctors, public policy makers, because they're the ones that uh, are, are sort of the problem as well because of all the rules and regulations they're imposing on doctors and other medical um, personnel. So I think we need to free up the market, which means deregulation as well. All right, the last question we got for the evening is from John. All right, Murray, good to see you. It's John Taylor up in New Jersey. Well, I don't see you. I see your name, but I hear you loud and clear, John. <laughs> congratulations on your retirement. Thank um, you so much. And congratulations on the book. I really, um, I'm looking forward to reading it. It's going to be next on my reading list. I can promise you that. And, uh, you know, I look forward to uh, talking to you about it after I get to read it. Um, but I... Um, you know, I've been thinking more along the lines, you know, being a surgeon of the healthcare delivery model. You know, we, we hear a lot about payment models um, and payment systems, but I think the other part of the equation that is being kind of ignored that we really need to address is the delivery model. Mm -hmm. um, you hit on a number of really key points um, that uh, I think need to be taken into account. One is accountability, you know, with our, with our current third party payer system accountability is going to be an unsolvable problem, in my opinion, as long as we have that current payment system. Um, type 2 diabetes and obesity, they're going to continue to be problems in this country. 
Um, the other is that it needs to be very patient centric. Um, so not only the payment models, but I also think the delivery models, very patient or consumer centric. And I like the fact that, um, you know, people are talking a lot more about direct primary care. And I think it really needs to center around primary care. But one of the major problems I see in the system now um, is that the, the delivery system is very siloed. You know, primary care is in one silo. Surgical care is in another silo. You know, all of the medical specialties are all siloed. Um, so all of, these, all of these platforms to kind of connect patients with providers, you know, I think are very good. They're a good first step, but, you know, the bottom line is it's not easy for patients to shop around mm -hmm. for a provider. You know, we hear anecdotal stories about people finding, you know, cheaper MRI and this and that, but, you know, even as, as a surgeon myself, it's not, I don't find it easy to shop around um, for, uh, for care. So, um, you know, we also, it, you also need to attract providers to these platforms, which is another difficulty, I think, in yep. that. So, you know, my thoughts are more kind of bigger, you know, that we just need a bigger integrated system, you know, that's maybe built around its own digital platform and information sharing, you know, and as I thought more and more about this, I got really excited when I heard about the Haven project. And then I was extremely disappointed when I saw that uh, Amazon and JP Morgan Chase and Berkshire Hathaway shut it down because I thought they had a really good opportunity there because in order to build this type of large integrated system, number one, I think you're gonna need a large employer that has the number of employed and covered lives to, um, to do something like this. And I think that kind of, We'll touch a bit on your second book um, that you have mentioned that you're, you're going to start writing. Um, but not only the employees, but the, but the resources just to build it. Because I think it's going to, you know, to build a big integrated system to bring all of these silos together, you know, like what Keith Smith has done with the Oklahoma Surgery Center is great, but that's really just outpatient surgery. Mm -hmm. So to put all of these together, surgical services, medical services, primary care, radiology, physical therapy, occupational therapy, nutritional care is going to take a great amount of, of resources. Um, so, you know, I, I think that Haven was going about it the wrong way. I think they were trying to, from what I, I could tell from what I read, is that they were trying to do something within the current system and try to work around the third party payer system where I think they needed to just create a brand new delivery model that's just going to make the old model obsolete and just kind of ignore what's going on in the insurance and, uh, and, and the government industry and just create their own, own system. Um, and that system, you know, will not only include price transparency, as everybody has mentioned, but I think another thing that is really missing is quality transparency. Mm -hmm. You know, right now, providers are really protected in the current system. You know, I, as a surgeon, I know who the, the bad doctors around me are. You know, we all, the, the physicians know who the bad docs are, but it's virtually impossible for the patient to really see the quality of the provider. Um, and I think if the providers are employed by this system, that, you know, it, quality can also be a very transparent part of it, much like any other brand. You know, when, when you look for a hotel, you know that if you book your room at a Ritz-Carlton, you're going to get a good quality hotel stay because they've built the brand and they've hired quality employees Whereas that, you know, and I think a system like this can weed out the bad, you know, you don't have to protect the bad doctors, you can just fire them and, and, and hire better ones. So, um, you know, I think that I would love to hear your thoughts on how maybe this can be revisited with, with perhaps a large company like Amazon, you know, maybe another large company like Walmart, you know, how maybe this something like this can be started. 
Um, another thing is I think we, we need to take a hard look at the fee-for-service system. You know, I've made a good living on the fee-for-service system, but I think it does present perverse incentives for those who are susceptible to perverse incentives like that. Um, and, uh, you know, so maybe some sort of uh, employ, you know, employment model with value-based based care um, is a better way to go. Yeah, uh, yeah, as you're speaking, John, I'm thinking of all the things that I try to remember from the um, conference a few weeks ago with what you're saying and uh, what I've experienced as, as a patient. And uh, I, I think that's something I want, I want to uh, pursue in, in the second book on medical care is that there are so many ways of uh, uh, possibly uh, delivering medical care. Let me give you one slight example of what you are talking about that could be a model that could be uh, used in the, um, in, the, in, in the medical care system. Uh, I'm a founding trustee of the BVMI, the Bergen Volunteer Medical Initiative in Bergen County, New Jersey, which was um, started by a retired uh, primary care doctor in uh, those plans starting in 2003, 2004, and it finally opened up its doors in 2009, and they're having their annual uh, fundraiser next month. But the point is, volunteer specialists, are working with BVMI so they can take care of patients who come to BVMI who are not eligible for Medicaid and they need a specialist to see them for whatever, whether it's a heart condition or a, it could be an oncologist or a gynecologist, what have you. And so they have, quote, for lack of a better term, a, a stable of doctors, specialists who, who, um, who BVMI funnels to them because they volunteer a group, uh, to participate in the BVMI BV, uh, mission of helping uh, people with low incomes get decent quality care. But if we could extend that concept to a direct primary doctor who could be at the core of a practice, and then in that practice, you could have specialists, the cardiologist, the urologist, the uh, neurologist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, you could build these uh, hubs where you could have, let's say, eight or 10 specialists uh, surrounding a primary care a doctor, or primary care doctors. And uh, that would be, I think, an interesting thing to, uh, to pursue if there's something out there like that. Because right now, if you want to go to a dermatologist, you have to go to the dermatologist's office. If you want to go to a cardiologist, you have to go to the cardiologist's office or an orthopedist. But if you have all these doctors under one roof, then you have uh, a comprehensive integrative approach. You can have a nutritionist on, on, on uh, uh, there also. So I think I'm starting to think about th things that I heard tonight that I'd like to pursue with many of you in, uh, in my next book, because uh, it's all about options, isn't it? Life is about options and which one is are we the most comfortable with and which ones are the doctors and the patients most comfortable with and build around that uh, premise and, uh, and, and see what works for, for people, wh whether it's what I just uh, uh, discussed or some other model. And John, I'd love to speak to you about your ideas about it because uh, the book is, is not to uh, be the final uh, 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 proposal for medical care. I'm not that smart to come up with the final best proposal, but to talk about what can be done that would, that would achieve the objectives, quality and low prices and good outcomes for patients. Excellent. Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time here. And sadly, one of the guests had to leave, but they actually have a thing called Pavilion, which is a little about what you're describing here, where everything's under one roof. And he's going to be guest hosting guest next hosting week. Next. So we're going to invite everyone to come back and also connect on that, continuing the conversation so we can keep making sure. sausage here with Murray. So thank you so much for tonight. Well, thank you. I just hope everyone gets the book, gives, gets a few books to give out for gifts. The, uh, the holidays are coming up. What better way to, uh, to give a, a, a wonderful gift to somebody? And as I said, all my royalties will be going to support uh, nonprofit uh, organizations, whether they're in the medical field or the economic education field, and try to get on as many radio and TV shows and podcasts. I did a podcast uh, Monday evening that's going to be posted next week. And um, uh, I just love to do as many uh, meetings uh, like this with people that you know in your network so we can... Uh, I can get ideas. Uh, uh, we can go back and forth about uh, what's the best way to uh, uh, 
to create a better system than we have today because God knows it's it's not working for a lot of people. And that's unfortunate because uh, if if we take the premise that people deserve medical, good medical care, then we have to come up with a method that is what non-coercive based upon compassion, uh, volunteerism and free enterprise. What a great summation. But before we do leave, I want to give one last thank you also to my co-host, Dr. Robert Campbell. So thank both of you for being here today. Thank well, you. Thank that, that, that was wonderful. And I, it, if I can put in one closing comment, I will say that please. whoever pays the bills and then in Jeff Cantor's cash payment system, the patients pay the bill. Whoever pays the bill gets to dictate what the system is like. So right, as long right. as the insurance company and the hospitals have all the money, um, we'll have this system. So I think the cash payment system and shopping, if we can get the customers to shop and get the doctors partic to participate, then not only are we lowering the cost of health care, but we're fixing the system one, one medical intervention at a time. And thank you for your, your book and your hard work. And, and uh, thank you for coming on Freedom Hub. Well, thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. The only way we make change is if we get the ideas out to the general public. And that's really what the goal of this book is. It's written so even Bernie Sanders could understand it. <laughs>